Um, so you have been around the past a few weeks, you'll have heard me uh, share about um, our Hope uh, School of Supernatural Life. Um, and one of the things that we teach our students um, in school is um, the verse from Hebrews 11.6 that says, without faith it's impossible to please God. It doesn't say without success it's impossible to please God, it's without faith. And so it's faith uh, that's expressed in risk that pleases God. And so what we do with our students is that we basically get them to take risks um, all year long, um, some quite easy, some extremely difficult. And then actually what has happened is that I've, as people have been stepping out and realising that God's pleased with them and that actually if God's pleased with them when they take a risk, we need to be pleased with them. And so we've been celebrating and applauding people and actually what's been happening is now they take risks as part of their everyday lives, like it's normal. And one of those people um, has been my mum, who has just finished a uh, year two of school. And um, she's a woman who, um, obviously I've known for a long time. <laughs> but, um, she would say to me, you know, I can't believe you did that. If I was telling her a story about, you know, like some crazy thing that I did or something that happened, she's just like, I could never do that. Um, and here's a woman who used to say, I could never do that. And uh, now is someone who will do things that I might not do. So <laughs> she, um, she will pray for people in the supermarket um, on the main street of my hometown, which is not like Buchanan Street, where you could kind of get away with anything and no one knows you. Where I'm from, there's about 4,000 people there and everybody knows you. And there are only two main streets, which are very short. And so if you're standing in the middle of the street praying for someone, everyone sees and they know who you are and they're like, what is she doing? Um, so uh, you cannot be incognito, but what, what is it? You know, even yesterday, she was telling me on the phone last night, she was out running yesterday and she's just chatting to God, like, you know, is there anyone you want to sing across my path? So she meets a woman who'd had a, um, a knee operation that she'd already prayed for before. The last time she saw her, she had six, this time she didn't. And it turned out the lady had a problem with um, part of the tendon or something in her knee or ligament had been accidentally something was cut or removed during the surgery when it ought not to have been touched. And so she's just like, oh, well, Jesus could just grow a bit on. And she says, praise for this lady while she's out of run. And actually, I was just being like, well, what actually has changed for her? What is it that she, why, why does she, why does she now do that? And actually, it's quite simply that she has um, heard God speak to her and tell her that, she, that he loves her, thinks that she's amazing. Um, she actually has understood who she really is, that she is a son and has the same kind as Jesus. Um, and she um, has, has had encounters with Father's love that just make her be like, wow, I am so precious in his eyes. And um, actually she just simply believes what the Bible says. Um, and so we're going to read some of what the Bible says in a minute, but first we're going to pray. But that was the end of Okay. Yeah, Father, I want to thank you that we are your kids and that we get to have um, fun exploits in the kingdom because you sent Jesus to die um, so that we could, um, we could have authority and power and we could just step into all that you have for us. And we just want to ask right now that um, this morning as we sit and um, listen um, to what you, you've given me to share that um, we would just have hearts that are open. But Holy Spirit, you have permission. We just want to give you permission, Holy Spirit, to rearrange the furniture and the inside of us, to illuminate and highlight the bits that are not lined up with what's truth in our life, but what you say about us. And we just want to give you permission to change us as we sit in our seats. Yeah, Holy Spirit, you're welcome. Come and change us. Amen. Okay, so what is it that my mom has come to believe? What is it that I have come to believe and so many of us um, have come to believe? Well, it is just really about being a kid and being like, well, God says it's true, so it must be true then. So Ma Matthew 10, 7 to 8 says, Jesus said to his, this is to his um, disciples, as you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near you. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. And then in Mark 16, you all know this, but it's always helpful to have a reminder. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. 
Whoever believes and is baptised will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their bare hand. And when they drink deadly poison, it will not harm them. They will place their hands on the sick, on sick people, and they will get well. Now, the last time that I checked, the Great Commission is still the Great Commission. And actually, as believers, as God's kids, this is not an optional extra for us. We can't, we can't say, well, you know what, the Great Commission is gift or personality dependent. No. And it is not, it doesn't say go into all the world if you are an extrovert or if you're an evangelist. Actually, this is for all of us. So if you, if you believe in Jesus, if you've given him your life, then you will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Um, and actually what that requires of us is that we need to take a risk. Because you need to take a risk to lay your hands on someone who's sick. Um, and so we're just going to be looking at that today. Um, so we are all um, called to do the impossible. And you know that sometimes like I get to travel around a lot and obviously through school and different places. And um, I actually have met a lot of Christians who are bored. Like just bored. Yeah. Bored of the relationship with God, bored of you know what even being a Christian means. And actually, when we get born again and filled with the Holy Spirit, we are invited into the biggest adventure of our lives. There's nothing boring about a relationship with Jesus. There is nothing boring about having the Holy Spirit living inside of us. And so if you're bored, then we take some risks. Um, and so I love the story that Danny Silk shares. I think it's maybe in his culture of honor book. And he talks about a friend of his who um, has um, basically decided that he's going to give up being a pastor or um, give up ministry. And um, Danny just says to him, you know, when was the last time you went out on a treasure hunt? And the guy was like, um, yeah, I can't remember. He couldn't remember. And Danny's just like, why don't you go and do a treasure hunt and then let me know how you get on? And uh, so the guy goes, does his treasure hunt, you know, takes some outrageous risks, sees God moving power, and then completely remind, is reminded of who he is and is like, oh, I'm not giving up the ministry. I'm definitely called to do this. And actually, the fascinating thing um, about taking risks is just what they do to us. So um, I uh, was looking at, um, just reading, well, it was kind of a bit of a download I got from God, really, about the 12 disciples. So when Jesus called the 12, it says, you know, Jesus called the 12 and they were called apostles. But after that, they're never called apostles again. Until, so they're called the disciples, or Jesus gathered the 12, or the disciples, the disciples, the disciples. Until Jesus sends out the 12, and then we read in Luke 9, the apostles returned to Jesus and reported everything that happened and told them what they did. And so actually, as they were, as they got sent out, they were sent out as disciples, ones who were, like they were, you know, like uh, students or learners. Um, but as they came back, they came back as um, world changers and sent ones. Yeah. And um, actually, well, I believe that until they were equipped and empowered uh, to go out and take risks at who they were, who the disciples were, didn't fully emerge. Uh, and I believe that the same is true for us, that actually risk taking reveals your true identity. And Joaquin Evans, who um, used to lead uh, the healing rooms in Bethel, is a friend of this church. Um, if you've not been here long, you wouldn't have ever had him visit, but um, I'm sure will be back sometime. But he says this, I don't know how to heal anyone. I just know how to spend time with the one who does. And it is so important that we, that we know who we are and that we spend time with Father. That actually intimacy, our intimacy and us knowing who we are, our identity are the key things before we start doing anything, before we take rest, before we start giving away what God's given us. Um, actually, it, it all needs to come out of an overflow relationship because otherwise we could get into performance and that is not what we're about. Um, Matthew 18 says that unless you turn and become like children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Um, and uh, Suki Spicer, who plays the flute and is sitting here in the front row, if you don't know her, she uh, was teaching, uh, I heard her teach recently, and she said this golden nugget of truth. You learn to be a child from time spent with your parents. 
You learn to be a child from time spent with your parents. And that is the same as, as we learn to be childlike from spending time with Father God. Um, and you know that Jesus talks about how he only did what he saw the Father doing or only do what I see in the Father's presence. And actually sometimes we can use that as an excuse for inaction because we think, well, I don't see the Father doing anything, so I'm just not going to do a thing. But actually, the thing, the truth is that we are sons like Jesus, which means that we live with a green light all the time. So I don't have to get a word of knowledge, I don't have to have Holy Spirit speak to me, and I don't have to have, I don't have to see the Father doing a specific thing. Yes, all those are amazing, and I'll definitely do stuff when that happens, but we're dispensers of heaven. Actually, you know, we pray, God, like, you know, you're, you know, Jesus taught us to pray, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Well, how do you think the kingdom's going to come? Through you. Actually, we are the ones that are, are called to dispense heaven. Um, and, because that's where we're seated. So we just get to, you know, we don't have to have all the knowledge. And so this, this week I did a bit of dispensing. Um, so in my office, I am, we have a young a student working with us just now. He's in um, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and he's uh, 19 years old. And he um, came in on Monday, uh, having ran into a wall uh, with one arm in a sling because he had fractured his elbow, and uh, his right hand uh, in a like a strapped up because he fractured his wrist. And uh, there wasn't really an opportunity to kind of pray or do anything on Monday, so it didn't really happen. Then a Wednesday comes in and uh, he, or, sorry, I went into the office and he's the only one there. And I'm thinking, oh come on, this is it. Like this is the <laughs> this is it, you know, here's your green light right here. So did I hear God say to me, go and lay hands on him? No. I just thought he's ill, he doesn't need to be. Heaven, I want heaven to come on earth and I'm gonna go and do some dispensing. And so um, I say, you know, I tell him, oh, you know, Jesus can heal that, you should just let me pray for you. And, and in fact, the guy who's his boss, he broke a bone in his hand a few years ago and he took put some persuasion, but I actually got to pray for him. And what happened to him was the doctors were like, oh, this is healed far quicker than they thought. So anyway, this young boy, bless him, lets me pray for him, just pray really quickly. And then, um, the other thing that happened was they also discovered that he bruised one of his ribs and when he was breathing in, he felt like this bubble underneath his rib. Anyway, I pray for him, and I, I'm like, oh, can you check it out, you know, what can you do? And he's like, that, that bubble was just instantly gone. He's like, but, well, that's just, that's, just a, that's just a coincidence. That's a coincidence. I'm like, yeah, no, it's not. <laughs> uh, so anyway, then, he doesn't really say anything else for the rest of the day, and then he comes in to work late on Friday, because he's been in the hospital just getting a checkup. And he comes in uh, minus his sling, and I'm like, so? I'm like, no sling, like, what's happened? And he's like, well, it's, it's healed far quicker than they expected. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, basically, he went from, on one day, basically, he couldn't straighten his arm, and then he's like, I, and he's showing me, he's like, I can do this, and I've got no pain. He's like, but it wasn't you, it wasn't you. And I was like, no, it wasn't me. Uh, and the fun, the fun thing about this, I said to him, you know, so how, how long were you meant to have this thing on for? Oh, I was meant to have it on for three weeks, and he uh, didn't even wear it for one, so that was quite fun. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, the thing about kids that I love, so we're to be childlike, and the thing I love about kids is that they take risks all the time. In fact, sometimes as like an auntie, I'm just like, mm, as they're about to do some crazy exploit, but kids, just have this ability to just relentlessly like pursue something or do it over and over and over because they're just not scared of failure or falling or whatever. They just have no issue with taking risks. Um, and I, uh, I've got uh, two older brothers, um, for those of you who don't uh, know that about me, and uh, when I was younger, I was thinking about this this week, just kind of popped into my head and said, like, oh, there's a fun story to share. So, um, I, um, when I was about six, maybe six years old, I used to go to, um, to be taken to school by my brother, so the primary school was like five minutes away from my house, and uh, on the way to the primary school there were steps, probably about 15 to 20 steps, um, which were maybe about a metre and a half wide by a metre deep, and um, the game is to run down the steps, placing one foot on each step, 
only one foot and then you kind of bound down. Then obviously I'm six years old, my legs are not that long and uh, inevitably I fall and I cut my knees. And so I go through the day, you know, cut knees and burst tights and come home and I'm like, Mom, stand at the back door, Mom, a wee accident. <laughs> And uh, this continued every day, every day, mom, a wee accident, and uh, basically got to the point where they were, you know, stitching my tights up and making me wear them backwards, and then eventually they thought, you know, forget the tights, she's wearing long, hangy socks because we're not having holes in her knees anymore. But why, what was it that was going through my head? Like, why did I continually take that risk and, and try to do that thing? And actually it was because I thought to myself, if they can do it, I can do it. And uh, so I wanted to do what my big brothers were doing. I wanted to, I wanted to do that. And so what actually happened essentially was that I pulled into my the time now. Well, I can't remember when I eventually managed it. Maybe I was like seven or eight. But I pulled into a, a sooner time or an earlier time, something that actually developmentally was probably not really for my age and stage. And what it meant was that I was able to do stuff that my peers weren't. So I'd say to my friends, can you do this? And of course they couldn't do it, but I had been practicing and learning. Um, and uh, the thing that I love is that our whole church family is like, we're a family and in a family, there are always people who are gonna be ahead of us, um, who basically are running ahead and um, that actually that we can learn from. And their, their risky lives, should actually start up a hunger in us to want to take risks too and to think, well, if they can do it, I can do it. Like, I can do this too, if they can do it, I can do it. Yeah. Yeah, rather than, oh, wow, that awesome person, they're so wonderful, I can't do that. Well, no, nonsense, they're no different from you. They're exactly the same as you are. They're human being filled with all these Spirit, just like Jesus. Um, another thing about being in a family is no wonder there are people who are ahead of us, but then there's the people that are running alongside us that we can like cheat each other on and be like, oh, I did this cool thing and you should totally do it too. And you've got people who you kind of like start up um, and then there are people who are behind us that we get to cheer on and pour into and invest in. And so I just want to ask you that, that question, like who are those people for you? Who are, who are the people that are, you know, that, you, that you're learning from? Who are the people you're running with and who are you pouring into and investing in and cheering on? So that eventually they run past you and then you get to keep up with them. And it's just this continual, perpetual, overtaking cycle. Um, James 2, 18 says, show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. And then again in verse 26, faith without deeds is dead. So faith requires action. Um, and in Matthew 17, um, when, and then I'm not going to read the story just for time's sake, but when Jesus, um, when he, um, you know, his disciples have tried to uh, cast a demon out of a young boy and they, and they haven't been able to. So Jesus, um, he does it for them and then afterwards they kind of speak to him in private and they say to him, why were we not able to do that? Like, why, why couldn't we do that? And he says this to them in verse 20, Matthew 17, verse 20. He said to them, because of your little faith, for truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Now, the thing about, um, just a bit of background, the thing about moving mountains would have been a common image um, for um, to the Jews, actually, because people in ancient times believed that um, a mountain was like rooted far beneath the earth. So for them, that was seen as like this um, impossible task or extremely difficult thing because, well, a mountain is rooted, so how many earth you ever move one? Um, and the other thing is that Jews uh, also had an expression um, that someone, some of their greatest teachers, they called them uh, removers of mountains or like a rooter up of mountains. Um, and the word, so Jesus said them because of your little faith, and the word little um, is uh, oligos uh, in the Greek. And that word could also be translated brief um, or short. Um, so in other words, if, if your faith wasn't brief, if you didn't just, you know, if your faith wasn't just used here and then you did everything else in your own strength, or you only use it when you need it, then you would be able to move a mountain. So basically, if we have faith that is the size of a mustard seed, but we have it all the time, 
we have it like all the time and we can see it amount to move and it will move. So it isn't about how much faith you have, but how consistently do you hold on to um, the seed that you have. So we just have a wee picture of a seed, just to, I also have some here, some wee seeds, they're not very big. And um, so we have a wee picture I'll just let you look at. So it's not about the size, it's about how consistently you hold on to what you have. So I love, um, I love telling stories of um, amazing things that God's done. And actually what I'm doing is like rehearsing my faith history with him so that I can hold on to my mustard seed and I can be ready for whatever comes my way. So I am, um, I was in uh, America just recently and on a holiday and uh, when I came, uh, I was flying back, I um, got delayed in Sacramento Airport, which meant that um, when I landed and turned my phone on in Los Angeles, the um, airline phoned me to say, the gate is closing, are you getting on the plane? I'm like, no, I'm not. <laughs> um, and so here I was, you know, and there was, this was like, what, what actually is happening here? I've got my mustard seed, uh, I'm holding on to it. And actually, um, what, I, what was going on inside of me was, I was like, I 100% trust Father God because he is so good at looking after me and has proven that time and time again. And I know that this is going to be fine. So, like, whatever he's worked out, you know, that Hebrews talks about faith uh, being the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. And so I was like, well, whatever the fight is that he's going to put me on next, all the unseen stuff, it's all taken care of, so it's going to be fine. And so I was completely at peace in the inside of hearing from Nick last week about living from a place of rest. So I was just living from this place of rest, being like, this is all totally fine. Like, like who knows what's like, who knows what's going to happen. Maybe I'm going to have to be sat on the plane next to some specific person, and that's why the plane flight's changed. Um, anyway, but, um, so here, I'm, you know, the thing was that my body reacted to the circumstances. So I totally fine in the inside, and yet I burst into tears. And um, so there's this sort of incongruity. I'm like, well, this is really interesting. Like, I am crying, but yeah, I feel totally fine in the inside. And so um, it was Catherine McNeil actually who reminded me that, that the same thing happened to Jesus. So you remember the story, Jesus um, has heard that his friend Lazarus um, has died and he, he's like, well, I'm not going, I'm not going, I'm not going to go there. And then he, he goes and he's standing in front of the tomb. He's already said to Martha, I'm the resurrection and the life. And if you know, do you believe that, you know, people are going to rise again and da, da, da. Anyway, he's standing in front of the tomb and, and Jesus knows, like, he's holding on to his mustard seed and he's full of faith. He's like, this guy is going to walk out of here. Yeah. And then he weeps. So Jesus like, burst into tears, but he wasn't like, you know, freaking out in the inside. He was perfectly at peace, living from a place of rest and, and full of faith, and yet he cracked. And so the thing is that it is normal for our bodies to respond to the situations we live through. But the question is, are we willing to trust God even when our bodies or senses are telling us otherwise? Because we're meant to be spirit-led. And so the thing about faith, it is not a feeling but it is a decision to jump and take a risk. And faith starts with a choice. Um, and uh, I just want to tell you a wee story about um, a couple of years ago, I went on a team uh, work thing. Uh, it was like a team building day. I went to Go Ape. Um, and you've got a wee photo. If those of you who don't know what Go Ape is, so you're up a tree and you're attached by harnesses. This is uh, me on the left and me on the right. So you're up a tree. And um, for those of you at home listening, I'm sorry, but yeah, I can't see these wonderful photos. Um, and so essentially you're kind of, you have different wires and things you have to walk along. So um, over here, um, this is just a bridge with nothing between it and you're harnessed on and you're walking across this thing and it's, uh, uh, and it's quite, quite scary. So um, obviously the whole time I am thinking, like basically, it was a surprise and I was thinking, my boss is taking me two places I would not want to go. One, fight water rafting, and two, go eat. Because my body does not enjoy being a pie. It doesn't react well to it. I could be at a place of peace in the inside, but my body is like freaking out. And so I didn't really want to do this. And then you get to the end of this, like, 
you know, massive risk taking assault course, and you get to this last M1, if you could show the next picture, please. And uh, so, what you see is uh, that wood there, that's you essentially standing on a platform, and this is called uh, the Tarzan rope swing. And uh, essentially, what you have to do, so you've got, um, you're hooked on above your head, and then there's just this vast expanse of nothingness in front of you, and then a cargo net at the end. And so, the idea is that you, According to the signs and instructions, there's wee men on like signs uh, pinned to the tree and tell you what you're meant to do. And the sign says, step off. <laughs> and so I'm looking at this thinking, right, so I might just step into nothing. And then what's going to happen is as I fall through the air, the cables over my head will connect and then swing me across this void and smack me into the cargo net. And then you bounce back. And then as you go the same time, you grab onto it. So I'm standing there and I'm like, Step off. <laughs> and I'm not moving, and you're like, so you're telling your head, you're, you're sending the signal to your brain to make your legs move. Step off. <laughs> and you're not moving. Step off, and you're not moving, and then you just think, oh, come on, come on, why are you not moving? Um, <laughs> and so you just, you, this is a moment where total confront fear. Confront your, overcome your head, which is saying, you're stepping into a void. Don't do it. And, um, <laughs> the thing about faith, um, that faith has eyes to see what is possible and feet that take steps forward. So faith has eyes to see what is possible and feet that take steps forward. And so whenever we have an opportunity to um, take a supernatural risk, we are almost always going to have fear and hesitation mixed with a bit of excitement. Um, and the thing is that we're invited every day um, we're invited every day by Father God to step off the ledge and jump into the unknown with Holy Spirit. Um, so <clears throat> one of the things that, um, that Paul tells Timothy um, in 1 Timothy 6, 11 um, is that he's to pursue faith. And the thing about faith, taking risks, is they are not just going to land in your lap. Actually, you have to look for opportunities. Um, and thankfully, we have been given the resources that we need to accomplish Mission Impossible. Yeah. We've got Holy Spirit. I mean, like, how many times do we need to hear this? I just say it to myself a lot, like, the same power, like, the same, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, that is a massive feat. Like, some, something raises Jesus from the dead, that's Holy Spirit. It's the same power that raised Jesus from the dead that lives inside of me. Yeah. That's a lot of power, right in here. And um, the thing is that, so the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, what is it that limits you? There's one to think about. And at some point, we have got to take a risk to release what is inside of us. Holy Spirit wants out. We just can't keep him in all the day. We'll explode, we'll implode. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a dictionary definition of risk is having the possibility of loss or injury. And Jesus said in Matthew 10, 39, whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. We need to be willing to lose our security, our safety, our status, our reputation, our respect, um, to just step out and take a risk. There's nothing safe about it, but we are assured that when we lay hands on the sick, they will recover. And the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives inside of us. So of course it's gonna be okay. And the thing about taking risks is it is not a spectator sport. I can't do it for you. No, other people can't do it for you. You actually have to do it yourself. Um, and the thing I love about Jesus is that he continually took risks. So I just want you to, look, the next time you're reading through the Gospels, have a look at what is the risk for Jesus. And remember that Jesus, when he walked the earth, was like totally like us, a human just like us, filled with the Holy Spirit just like us. And so everything was a risk for him. Yeah. He reaches out and touches a leper. He doesn't know well. For one, that is illegal uh, religion. You know, and they're in the law, that's illegal to touch a leper, for one thing. But Jesus didn't know like, what was going to happen. Was like leprosy going to come on his hand? Or do you know what I mean? Like yeah. He takes a risk, puts his hand on the leper. He takes a risk by, um, you know, saying to the servants, um, here, fill these jars with water. Yeah. And then take some of the water. 
to the master of the feast. No, eh, well, turn it into wine for you first. If the water gets taken to the master of the feast, then at some point, who knows, as it's about to touch his lips, it becomes wine? I don't know. Huge risk. Massive risk. Jesus can be kicked out of the wedding or all sorts of stuff that happened. Um, he touches the coffin of a dead boy during the dead boy's funeral procession. Huge risk. Massive risk, because you weren't really meant to come into contact with dead bodies. Again, the way the law worked. And, you know, Jesus just ruins the whole thing. And, like, who knows what could have happened? It might not have worked or you know, anything. Massive risk. Huge risk. Jesus gets in the boat and they sail over because he wants to go over to where the Gadarene man is. I'm sure everyone's probably heard about this guy. Who knows what the stories have been or people maybe have come back with black eyes because he attacked them or whatever. And this guy, so he's naked, hadn't worn clothes for a long time, so he's going to look pretty awful because he's hanging out in tombs, so he's probably manky. He was cutting himself with stones, so he's like, you know, sliced up and scabbed and probably had bits of chain still attached to him. Massive risk. But Jesus just like goes for it because he knows that Holy Spirit is powerful and can do anything. Um, and then the biggest risk of all, Jesus going to the cross. He didn't know what it was gonna he didn't know what it was gonna look like to go down and get the keys back from Satan down to the pit of hell. Massive risk. He didn't know. Was it gonna make you know he he's like in faith, with his mustard seed, trusting in God, you're going to save the whole world when you die. But massive risk. And the thing about Jesus is that he modelled risk in such a way that his disciples are the ones who are like, do you want us to call down fire from heaven on this Samaritan village? Because he just modelled risk in around him and it made people want to take risks and do scary things like Peter and get out the boat and decide, well, I'll just have a prance in the water too, why not? Um, so how do we grow our faith? Well, it is like building muscles. You hear people say that all the time. Um, but the thing about building muscles, as someone who has a personal trainer and has been training a lot recently, it is sometimes painful. Um, and actually it takes time and you need to keep on going for you to get stronger. Um, it has to be intentional until it becomes a habit. I read this recently and I thought it was brilliant. It says habits are not the product of one decision. They are the result of repeated choices that eventually become automatic responses. And so taking a risk is not a one-time event, but it is a lifestyle. Um, and actually, the, the key is regularity. Like, when I go to the gym, or if I'm in a season where I run a lot, if I'm doing that regularly, like, everything's fine. If I don't run for six months, it's gonna be quite hard in between times when it, the first one that I do. So the longer we leave it, the more difficult it is because we just forget, oh, this is, oh, I'm quite scared. But, you know, actually we need to, we need to keep um, taking risks. The thing about risks is that it's like the parable of the talents principle that actually the more that we take risks, the more we invest, then the greater the reward. If we do nothing, then we get no reward. Um, so playing and save is not an option in the kingdom. And when I was in, back at the beginning of May, I uh, was over in Paris and the church over there had asked me to go over and speak at their weekend week. And uh, one of the things that we did, um, so I had Kezia with me, and one of the things we were doing was taking um, people from our church onto the streets. And so we're in this small um, village and the rain is falling and there's like hardly no one around. And um, we walk, one of the clues on my treasure map is uh, Iber Peterson. We walk past this bar, and sure enough, there's the man with the eyebrow piercing. But I keep walking because I'm like, oh, he looks really scary. Oh. And so, before I can react to that emotion, I'm like, right, this man is response to my clue. We're going to go prophesy over him and love on him. Who's coming with me? So, this girl says, I'll come with you. Off we go. I try not to think about it. And we approach this man, and not only does he have um, his eyebrow pierced. He has a spike in between his eyes here. Uh, he's got a ring in his nose. He's got a spike through his chin. He has uh, rings all down both ears. He has a skin head apart from the Mohican in the middle. He is wearing a vest covered in tattoos and he has got um, jeans on that are sliced all the way down and um, so you see more skin than you do jeans. 
and he has no front teeth on the top or the bottom. He's smoking a cigarette and has a glass of whiskey in his hand. And I'm thinking, oh, Jesus, what am I to my mustard seed of faith right now? You have used me before, you can do it again, come on. So um, we approach the man and long story short, we get to prophesy over him and he says to us, first of all, the first girl pro the girl I'm with prophesies first and um, he's like, where are the cameras? We're like, no, this is, there are no cameras. And then I prophesy over him and he's like, no one on this earth knows that about me, what you've just said. No one knows that. How do you know that about me? Like, are you part of a sect? Who are you people? So we just explained to him that God has sent us in the rain right here, right now, because God knows everything about this guy. And uh, then we were just like, you know, massive risk because this guy, you know, is an interesting character. And we're like, could we give you a hug? Would that be okay? And so we both took it in turns to hug this guy, and he just wept, and he was just overcome by the love of God. And the thing is, risks when we take them, there's always a reward. I was just, I was blown away. I was like, this man who looks so scary. He is like the biggest, softest guy in the whole world. And God just met with him in the rain in a small uh, village in Burgundy. Um, and the thing that I love, I love um, a few weeks ago, Jan uh, Treadgold uh, shared the story about how she took a risk um, on an aeroplane going to Italy. And what I loved about her story, you know, and she, uh, for those who don't know the story, you can have probably a lesson online, but um, basically she um, you know, reaches out to someone who's under a cover and crying. And the thing that I loved about that story is that it was totally jam. It was her just using and investing the talents and the skills and the gifts that God's given her and deciding to be a dispenser of heaven over this uh, lady. That it didn't have to look like anyone else, it just looked like, um, it looked like her and it looked like God at work um, through her. And uh, the other thing, the other person who is just extremely courageous and brave is uh, Joe Hall. He um, is Andy Trees' son-in-law, for those who don't know him. Tall guy with a beard, often plays the bass guitar. And he um, will come with me um, and we'll, we'll go on team and do different ministry trips. And the thing about Joe is that he, unlike some other people on the team, most of the things that happen on a ministry trip are a risk for Joe. So he would probably describe himself as a bit of an introvert. So standing at the front and doing a wee bit of speaking on a Sunday morning, massive risk. He doesn't really like standing at the front and talking. Um, leading a team in the streets, not his idea of fun, massive risk. Calling out a word of knowledge. And then when the person responds, prophesying over them when you have nothing, huge risk. Um, but the thing about Joe is when he's in the streets, he'll just walk up to someone and he shakes their hand and he's like, hello, I'm Joe. And then the person, then he sort of stands there with them and then they open up their life, tell him, tell him everything about them, all the things that have gone wrong, and then he gets to pray for them. And I'm just like, wow, like, that is, a, that is totally not what it looks like for me. But that is fine, 100% fine, is that I, I would not be someone who would pray for someone crying on the plane. I would probably put my earphones in and turn my music up. Or I would just release peace from afar. But actually... <laughs> You know, we, we are all different, but actually we can all take risks and it doesn't have to look the same. There's no prescription, there's no prescriptive model. It just needs to be um, us being used by God and being available to him. And so why, God's just so pleased that we do think that he is just like, yay, come on. And, but why? Why is he so pleased? Why is he excited that when we take risks? Well, it's really simple. And it is this, ready? Hold on to your seats he gets to do something. 2 Corinthians 5 20 says that we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. So it's like God's hands are tied behind his back and he's got like a bit of masking tape over his mouth and he's just waiting for us to do something so he can be like Wah! and then like do something through us. Um, but it's a partnership. I take a risk and he comes in power. And this is actually about, it's about you letting him use you. And it doesn't have to look a certain way because me partnering with God is not going to look like Suki partnering with God, it's not going to look like Jan partnering with God, it's not going to look like Nick partnering with God because I am unique and individual and how I'm going to speak is not going to be the same. How I'm going to respond to a person, it's all going to look different but it's about us using 
the gifts that God's given us and just being available uh, to him. And why do we do it? Why, why take risks? Why am I even talking about this today? Well, it's quite simply this. Everyone on this planet is God's child. He loves them, he knows them by name, and he wants to be in relationship with them. But they don't know that they're his kids, which is where we come in. And the thing is that no one buys a car. I've never, you know, bought a car and not tried it out first. And that's the same with people. We can't expect people to give their lives to Jesus because we convince them intellectually. They need to have an experience of him. They need to taste and see that he's good and then be like, oh, wow, if this, if this is God, the one who's just got me in a wheelchair, if this is God, the one who's just opened my ears, if this is God, the one who's just opened my eyes, I want to, of course I want to give my life to him. And the truth is, as hard as this is to hear, that there is a world out there that are dying and who are going to hell. And that actually people are depending on you to walk like Jesus. You might be the only Jesus they ever meet. So there's some days that, you know, taking a risk for me looks, you know, different than on another. So that could be, you know, I love old people and I particularly love when there's a wee old granny or a wee old grandpa behind me in the supermarket. And you just say to the checkout person, just put their groceries through to you and I'll get them. And then the wee person's like, oh, no, 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 that's not their stuff. It's like, well, it's okay, I'm just going to get it for you. And they are messed up because they, they're they like, a young person wants to like buy me my shopping? I'm like, oh, yeah. And then they can, like, they've got a wee pension. They don't have very much money. And they get blessed, and I get—I always touch them, always touch them on the shoulder. And I'm like, do you know what? Have an amazing day. You are so special. I don't—I don't necessarily tell them that Jesus loves them or any of that. I just link Jesus on them and come to them. Or I can, you know, like in my workplace, like you know, it's very formal to shake someone's hand, and I don't really like shaking people's hands very much because I always just don't like it. Because you don't wear your hands <laughs> anyway, um, So I. <laughs> But what I do do is I take a risk and I am like, I'm just going to meet Jesus in this person. So someone comes to my reception and I'm like, hi, I'm Jan. The glory, I have no idea who you've just come into contact with. Ah, ah. <laughs> and so it looks different. I mean, sometimes it is, I'm going to just pray for a complete random stranger for them to be healed. But um, it is always different. But the, the, the important thing is that I continually practice so that when I face a mountain, that my mustard seed of faith has been constant. And so I'm able to say to this impossible situation, move and it'll move. Um, and <clears throat> Chad Dedman is um, someone who is based over in Bethel. And one of your bits of homework, of which there are going to be a few before I finish, is to watch on YouTube um, the story, it's called Grocery Story Healing Outbreak. Grocery Store Healing Outbreak. And it's based on this outrageous story, which I won't share right now, because that's your homework, but I will tell you one bit. Loads of people get saved. Anyway, um, and healed. Um, what he says about that exact story is that the key to having extreme outbreaks of healing is to faithfully pray for the one that God puts in front of you. So he doesn't have, you know, many healing services in supermarkets every day. But what he does is he prays for whoever comes across his path. So if you go to your friend for coffee and they're like, oh, I am just, um, I cannot sleep at night. You're like, they cannot sleep at night. And so on, like, mm, Jesus could heal that. Or, oh, my back's so sore, I pulled a muscle. Oh, my back's sore, Jesus could heal that. Actually, what are you doing? Is you, who are the people that you are coming across on a daily basis who could just receive a touch from all of God? So some of the reasons we don't take risks, and just uh, quickly one more time, um, we can sometimes believe the thoughts racing through our head um, over what God's truth is. So when we're out in the streets or you're you know, faced with whatever it is, you could be like, oh, you could be like, I don't know what to say, they might be offended, what if this doesn't work, uh, I'm going to look like a fool. And actually what we do is we convince ourselves to do nothing before we even say hello to the person. And so the trick is, try not to think about it. <laughs> just do it. Like I said, you know, that walk past that man, all the piercings, I'm just like, Whoa! But I was like, right, this is what we're going to do. Okay, yeah, let's go. Because I 
because I just did not give my time a chance, uh, give myself a chance to dwell um, on that. Ignore yourself and do it anyway. That is my top tip. Um, <laughs> and the other thing is that fear um, can often paralyze us. The enemy tries to use fear to um, keep us from our destiny and to trick us into believing that the threat is big and true when it actually isn't. Um, when we focus on the enemy and we focus on the, the thing that is the fear, then we've already lost the battle because we've let fear dominate us. And Chris Valentin um, says this, the dogs of doom stand at the door of our destiny. They start to bark when we are about to cross the threshold of our God-given purpose. When we take our eyes off Jesus, like Peter when he was walking the water, when he looked to the waves and listened to the wind, and wasn't looking at Jesus, that's when he started to sink. So we just need more of his love, actually. Perfect love casts out all fear. So we just need to be continually experiencing his love, which is why intimacy is the key. And then the other thing is that sometimes we think, well, I'm not going to take a risk because I just don't know if God will do this. Well, can I suggest to you that the, the only way you're ever going to see God do things is that the very answer to you being not confident in God doing it is to step out and take a risk and watch him do it. And then you'll be like, oh, he totally comes with the power and heals people when I lay my hands on them. So the more we, we just actually have to do it. Um, so practice, very important. And actually the safe place to do that is in here. Um, before you go out there. Um, but other things to think about. Hands up if you ever eat in a restaurant. Okay, one way you can practice, easy way of practicing, Holy Spirit, how many children does the waitress have? And then you always work like three, and then you say to the, the waitress, excuse me, um, do you have three children? And she, she might say, yes, why? And you're like, oh, no reason. Or she might say, no, I've only got one, or whatever. But the likelihood is the conversation will open something up and it will go somewhere. You can just practice hear him from God, take a risk, and the person doesn't even know that, that that's what you were doing. Or whoever uses like the online chat tool on a website, you know, it's like, do you want to chat to an advisor now? Well, I practice getting words of knowledge for the person, because <laughs> they can't see me. And I'm like, excuse me, I was like, do you have a back pain in your body right now? And they're like, no. And then I'm like, oh, well, I just feel like you need to hear that you're this, you're amazing. I just, this is, no, you just start taking a like, promise out of them, and it's safe because they can't see you. And you, most of the time, you don't leave an email or a phone number, you just be like, my name is whatever your name is, and then you just chat to this person about whatever the product is you're having a problem with. <laughs> Easy and safe and fun way to practice. Um, or practicing, you know, no, if you say to your friend, you know, I would just love to encourage you, would that be okay? Actually, people will always um, let you encourage them. So that's what I would like you to do, to do. So if you're leaving to get your kids, you need to just hear that your homework for today before you leave is to encourage someone um, before you leave here today. Um, so your job is to encourage them before you leave. Um, and find people to co-run and run alongside. Who are those people that are going to cheer you on? And one other final thing to say before we're, we're just going to pray. Um, often like a word does not make sense to us and we're like, oh, well, I'm not going to share that because it makes no sense to me. It's not meant to make sense to you because the word's not for you. 